Welcome to Decoding DX. We're a group of fourth year medical students with a passion for education and patient care. This episode of Decoding DX is for educational purposes only and should not be used as medical advice. Please consult your healthcare provider for any medical needs. The opinions expressed represents those of the participants and are not of our affiliated institutions. Thank you for joining us on Decoding DX. We keep learning so much through this experience and we're so glad that you're learning alongside with us. Now, let's get to the episode. Welcome to another episode of Decoding DX. We have a fun case tonight of dehydration. So to start off, um, I'll have our discussants introduce themselves. So we'll start with you, Justin. Uh, tell us who you are, where you're at in training, and something about you that does not involve medicine. Uh, hello, my name is Justin. I'm a second year child neurology resident at Children's Mercy Hospital. Um, for those that don't know, child neurology is like a two year general peds, and then one year of adult neurology, and then two years of child neurology. I, I what was the rest of the questions? Uh, something about you that does not involve medicine. Ah, uh, yes. Um, I almost went into a career of professional gaming, and I've written my own fiction novel. It's, it's over there. So. <laughs> That's pretty cool. <laughs> That's really cool. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Sarah, what about you? Yeah, so I'm a third year medical student. Um, I guess one fun, f oh, what am I pursuing? So I'm still thinking about what I want to do, but I'm thinking more primary care, internal medicine, maybe med psych, maybe neuropsych, but I haven't quite made a decision yet. And um, I guess one interesting fact, I lived in like the Northeast for 13 years, went to college outside of Boston, lived in New York City and like Baltimore and DC working um, in my prior career as a, I was a campaign researcher at a healthcare workers union for about four or five years. Wow, that's awesome. All right, well, we'll go ahead and get started then. Um, so our chief complaint is we have an eight-year-old who is previously healthy. He's a male who he's had three days of nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, and diarrhea. So, you know, we haven't really done as many PEDS cases. Um, so Sarah, when you, you know, are thinking about a PEDS patient, what, what things, what's your approach to these kind of patients, these kind of patients? What's your approach to kids? How about we say that? Um, and how might you kind of change how you talk to them? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I haven't yet done my pediatric rotation. Um, I have did a little bit as medical, as a medical scribe in the ED for pediatric stuff. So I had a little bit of exposure, but I guess with them, you could talk to the kid and ask him um, how they're feeling and have they been eating or drinking. Of course, address the patient, but knowing that the collateral um, information is going to come probably from either the father or the mother or whoever parents are there or relatives. Um, so I guess like make them feel comfortable, put them at ease and don't scare them at first because that's the one thing. Some of the kids are hate the hospital and they cry all the time when they even see like a stethoscope or something or an otoscope I've seen. So you just got to be careful depending on the kid. Yeah, absolutely. And then Justin, what are your thoughts kind of on this chief complaint presentation? Is there anything that, you know, you're starting to think about right away before you get even any more additional information? Yeah. Um, so, you know, PEDS is kind of funny in that it, I, you know, I'm sure in adult land, like, the large variety of presentations of chief complaints can slightly differ in like a 30 year old versus a 40 year old versus like a 50 or 60 year old and some of the things you think about. Um, but I feel like in PEDS, there's very much definitive ranges of the kids that um, you have to approach very, very differently. You know, like if I saw this triad of symptoms in like a six month old, uh, my, my level of concern and what I'm thinking about is very different than what I'm thinking like a two-year-old, when I'm thinking like a five to 10-year-old, like school age versus like a teenager, you know? And so, um, or like, you know, Lord forbid a neonate. Uh, so that's the first thing that's kind of going through my mind. Uh, the other thing is that like kids are very, very deceptive. Um, and there's kind of the old adage of, uh, you know, kids look great until they don't, right? And so kids can crump really, really quick and they can look really great 
or they could just just be fine and you kind of have to just you know deal with them being relatively fussy or upset and not really understanding what's going on and so um for an eight-year-old with these symptoms and not walking in and seeing the patient, like literally like walk in that, that door exam, uh, it's sometimes harder to get a really good read. But right now, just hearing those, I'm not like, I'm not very concerned right now with no other information anyway. All right, excellent. That's a great thing to think about with our, with our PEDS patients. All right, so a little bit more history um, of the, the pro- present illness. Um, so they had three days, uh, three days previously, um, a patient started having a fever and abdominal pain, and it's gotten worse over the last 12 hours or so. Um, reports also having nausea and then not being able to keep anything down. So we're taking in, always spitting it or throwing back up. Um, this patient had previously been seen in the ER. They did an ultrasound. They did a CT scan of abdomen and pelvis, um, and that showed uh, met multiple mesenteric lymph nodes, but no appendicitis, no intussusception, which is kind of one of the two of those big things that we think about in this age range. Um, he was diagnosed with mesenteric adenitis, and he was sent home with ibuprofen previously. Um, he's had continued pain, hasn't been able to keep anything down. So that's why his mom brought him back into the ER. You know, it's kind of one of those things that you b- think about bringing or uh, wanting patients to come back. It's those return precautions would be, you know, not being able to keep anything down. Um, so Sarah, with this information, um, are there any can't miss diagnoses that you're thinking about right now? And have we already ruled it out based on what we the information that you have? So let me see. So intussusception is one and appendicitis. We've seen he has a CT scan, thankfully. Um, I think for him, an eight-year-old, I guess maybe just we get his vital signs. I don't know. I'm not very good with children yet, but with the sepsis, just signs for you do the physical exam, of course, for signs of dehydration. And if it's like severe, or moderate to severe, of course, that's kind of scary. Um, you can do like the skin turgor, I know that, and then like some cap refill. And then you can kind of tell based on the kids, um, kind of like uh, if they're, they're like a constitutional, like how do they appear and how they're acting. So I think maybe like sepsis and then potentially, because I'm on neuro, you could see if sick contacts, of course, but in the U.S., it would be less likely to be like diphtheria or typhoid. <laughs> but, but I mean, if you're in a different country, you got to think about other things, too, I guess. Um, so I don't know. I'm probably rambling. So I guess infection, um, since his, he has no significant findings in the CT and ultrasound, just watching for that, I guess. I don't. And then the dehydration, because you don't want to have hypovolemia and like organ damage from it. Mm hmm. Trying to think of anything else. Do you th- do you think that the imaging that they got at the previous during the previous time he presented, do you think that that is sufficient to say that he, that he doesn't have an appendicitis or intussusception at this point in time? Um, actually, no, because it's it was done twelve hours ago. You said, I believe but, so. I guess you could do things like um, they could do a few exams. I know with appendicitis, like. Um, to make sure that he doesn't have the, the pain that happens when you like, I know, hit the kid's foot. I don't know the, the term for it. When you, t- you tap on their foot to see if they have referred pain up into their abdomen, the visceral pain. But I guess they could do that. I, I'm just surprised they did a CT scan at that point in time. He must have been pretty sick because usually in the pediatric emergency department, they're very hesitant or, you know, to do CT scans because of the radiation. So he must be pretty sick. So that is concerning, I guess, that they did a CT scan. Um, so, and then maybe ingestion. I don't know if they did a talk screen. He could have ingested something. I guess some poisons or something, something to consider. Yeah, I don't, absolutely. I'm not very good at this. I'm sorry, guys. Oh, no, no, no. You did, yeah, that's, that's, you did a fantastic a, job. Yeah, Justin, what, anything else you got? Um, so let me preface this by saying I hate abdominal pain. It's a very different chief complaint um, than the other two. Uh, especially when it's thrown into the mix. Um, one, I, w- I just want to like encourage Sarah that that was a really, really good um, kind of just assessment of 
you know what 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 things could be going on. I also want to say that like I, I my first impression is that I, I'm very shocked and and agree with Sarah. Actually, I'm glad she picked this up. I was going to go on my talking points that they did a CT scan, um, especially after what I'm assuming was a negative ultrasound, right? And so when you think about these kids coming in, like. Vomiting, nausea, abdominal pain, diarrhea is some of the most common things you see in kids ad nauseum. Um, and, uh, and the thing about kids is that like, common things are very common. And so like the number one go-to thing for most people in this regard would be like, this is a viral gastroenteritis. This is a virus that is affecting the stomach lining and the intestinal lining that has disrupted, um, you know, a lot of uh, how the how has disrupted the line? Yeah, I already said that, disrupted the lining to where you're now just losing fluids, and a lot of it is just symptomatic management until the body self resolves this. And so, you know, unless that kid had like really low blood pressure, and unless that kid was pretty feverish, which you did say he had a fever, um, unless that kid looked like septic and was like acutely nastily vomiting and stuff, like I'm, I'm really surprised why why they did the CT. Like, did he not respond to fluids? Did he not respond to like just ibuprofen to bring his fever and pain down? Um, so yeah, I'm really, really, I'm almost more curious about the last year visit, but I guess kind of like thinking about, so the assumptions either someone did a garbage job um, or the kid was pretty sick and I've seen both in the ER. You know, <laughs> like I've seen kids that got the, the million dollar workup um, and then I, I admitted them up in the floor and two hours later the kids eating, drinking, <laughs> And, and 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 we discharged like next morning you know it's like why did this kid get admitted uh but i've also seen kids where uh, their life was saved because of like um an imaging that someone was a little too careful so um yeah those are some initial impressions on kind of and i will I'll also say that mesenteric adenitis is so so rarely diagnosed um and i think of it largely as a diagnosis of exclusion you know, it's, it's not something you can just say like, that's mesenteric adenitis right there. Classic. Yeah, it's, 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 that's either not a thing that I'm aware of, or it's like so uncommon. Um, and so uh, that's also kind of surprising that this kid left with that diagnosis and not like something else. Almost, almost makes me wonder if it was a, an adult ER uh, resident that um, worked this kid up. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, no, I think that those are both great input. And yeah, Sarah, you, you did a fantastic job, especially if you haven't done your pediatrics rotation yet. I don't know that I would have been able to do any better. And I have done a pediatrics rotation. Um, so let's oh. go ahead and get a little bit more history. Um, so generally, he's been a healthy kid, no known other diagnoses, um, lives with mom and mom and an older brother, um, no concerns for any allergens, toxins, any ingestion kind of things like that in the house that they're aware of. Um, doesn't take any medications. So that's kind of, you know, that's, that's your, your general peds backstory for the most part. Um, nothing real concerning in his history. Um, but we'll go ahead and get uh, some, some vitals um, and uh, review of systems as well. Um, so I guess we'll start with review of systems. So he does have a headache and then everything else that we uh, that we noted in the HPI. Doesn't have any chest pain, any difficulty breathing, any rashes, and also doesn't have any sick contacts um, or recent travels or anything like that that uh, they report. All right, so let's get that. We'll go ahead and go with the vitals and physical exam findings. Um, so. He uh, has a temperature of 39.6 Celsius, heart rate of 123, blood pressure of 102 over 59, and he's satting 95% on room air. I don't have his respiratory rate here, um, but uh, we'll, we'll look more in the physical exam. Um, so generally speaking, um, He's ill appearing, he's lying on the bed, he's curled up. He does not pass the door test when you look at him initially. Um, H-E-N-T, um, he's got dry mucous membranes, no tears that are appreciable. 
um, no rhinorrhea. Um, patient won't let you, he won't let you like look in his mouth or anything. And that's, you know, hard enough as it is, but he's does not, he's not, you know, helping you participate at all in it. Um, cardiovascular, um, it's tachycardic, it's regular rate and rhythm, um, normal S1, S2, no additional heart sounds, uh, or murmurs, abdominal exam. Um, it's soft, diffusely tender to palpation with some mild guarding, um, but no, no rebound. Um, so that you're concerned about there. Um, and then skin exam, it's warm, dry, no rashes. Notably, he's got a capri fill of about three to four seconds. So that's a little bit prolonged. Um, and then you did a, a you're not exact, you weren't exactly a, a peds neuro uh, resident, but you did a basic neuro exam and that was with the normal limits, no focal neurologic deficits um, that you noted. So Sarah, you know, kind of taking in that physical exam review systems, vital signs, um, and does anything that you saw there change your differential or kind of ring something that makes you think something is more likely than not something else? So I guess just with the headache, just because meningitis can be something that's very, um, I guess he's been three days, so that's probably less likely, but it's something to just consider. I know his focal, he doesn't know like neurological deficits and his exam is okay, but still that's a possibility and something that needs to be ruled out. Um, depending on this headache and everything else, because I know nausea and vomit can potentially be associated with it. And he's also eight, so he might not be able to describe everything, but he could potentially have like issues with his eyes, maybe phonophobia or photophobia or other things. So just that to be considered. And then of course, the vital signs, and I mean, on the exam, sorry, it's the severe dehydration. I only looked this up like on, I was looking up a bit about this uh, before this call, like a, a couple hours ago. So I, I now know that that severe de dehydration with the cap refill and also with the lack of tears, it's uh, considered 10% or greater of loss of body water. So definitely he needs fluids and he needs to be treated um, immediately to, um, you know, to stop any end organ damage or any other problems with the severe dehydration. So I guess yeah. that's, of course, number one, get, getting the fluids, but also considering meningitis, but less likely. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a, a great, great point and things that change. Yeah, I think that it, it kind of also points to the, you know, there might be something, it's that underlying what's going on that's causing that. But number two, you know, if you have that clearly dehydrated, um, you know, you want to also treat, you know, symptomatically, it might just be a symptom of what's really going on, but that can also, you know, be extremely harmful, like you had mentioned with organ, organ damage um, in our pediatric population. Um, Justin, anything to add or anything that, that kind of popped up when you were looking at the exam vitals review systems? Uh, yeah, and yeah, I could, I could talk forever. Um, it's kind of, kind of who I am. Uh, I'll start with one thing, you know, he's still feverish. So one question I always kind of wonder is that fever after he was given like a dose of like normally like um, nurses, well, as soon as a kid walks in, that nurse takes a look at the kid and just pops some Motrin in his mouth. And then, and then I see them. Right. And so that's not uncommon. Um, and so I wonder if that's be taken before or after a recent antipyretic. Another common question we ask is like, what have you been doing for symptoms, right? So moms at home will say like, oh, you know, I've been giving Tylenol and ibuprofen. And so one thing you always want to assess is because in kids, we care a lot about like appropriate dosing. So I, I you know, I know adults, adults, um, it's kind of a lot of like clinical trial based dosing regimens, but in kids, uh, a lot of our um, uh, dosing is done weight based per kilo. And so you'll see, you'll, you'll hear like the pediatric language is a lot of like slang with like per kilo dosing and stuff like that. And so, um, so I, one thing I'd like to ask is like, oh, what have you been doing for the fever? And they may say, oh, some Tylenol. I'm like, how much Tylenol? And like, we actually care about that. And so they were like, oh, and then you have to do so much math. They'll be like, oh, five mils, you know, it's like, okay, well then you're like, well, what concentration? Right. And so like, are they doing five mils of the hundred, like hundred mg per five? And so, and then like, once you do the the milligrams and then you have to calculate the the mils per kilo and so Tylenol is 10 to 15 
milligrams per kilo, depending on how much you care to use. And so there's like, that's like, you know, whipping out your whiteboard and you're running triple integrals, right? And stuff like that. But um, that, that's, that's one thing I, I'd like to know is like, are they appropriately dosing uh, whatever likely, this is likely infectious to me, but some likely viral infection to, tr to make the patient feel better. Um, going down kind of other things that I noticed. Uh, yeah, this just kind of like laughs, it makes me laugh because there's some things that like either you don't have enough time in real life because you have 50 billion other patients or, or is it, it, what I call a, a textbook sign. And so right here it says no tears. Like, did you slap the kid? Like, how, how did you assess that? You know, <laughs> it's like, you ain't crying, Jim. You know, like, you know, it's no tears, right? Um, and so if, if, if some, if, if like a med student or intern checked that out to me, my first question would be like, what, you know, what, how did you assess that, right? Like, unless you came in and told the kid like it, Barney died um, and he's not crying. And so I don't know. Um, but yes, that is pretty severe if that, is, if that you've truly ascertained that. Um, things that really stuck out to me, because, you know, I've seen a million kids like this. The heart, the blood pressure is really good actually. Um, one thing you can do to calculate blood pressure is, so like every patient starts with a systolics of 70 blood pressure, and then you can just like throw on seven for every year. And that's like a general decent assessment for normal blood pressure range, at least for systolics. Um, so theirs is fine. It's totally appropriate. And you know, there's always a range, right? But uh, it's, it's appropriate. And then heart rate, that's actually like uh, smaller than I thought it'd be. You know, sometimes I see these kids like 130s, 140s, um, and that's not like scary even. Uh, and when you think about heart rate, you always have to think about like, you know, what can be causing it? Is it anemia? Is it dehydration, which is the most common thing? Uh, is it the fever? Is their body just internally really upset at something? Is it pain? And so heart rate, that kind of becomes its own game. But this one is likely dehydration. Um, the dry mucous membranes, yes, kids that's pretty easy to notice. Um, always look at the tongue, uh, look at the buccal surfaces, um, you know, look at not the eyelids, right? Uh, those all help you out. And then um, cap refill. So on every patient, this patient could be coming in for like a, what's a really, like a, uh, you know, a, any other diagnosis, like ear infection. They can be coming for ear infection and I would still check cap refill because kids, once they feel crappy, they don't eat or drink anything. They're just, they're just sick of it until they feel better. And so they're always at risk for dehydration from so many things. So I check cap refill on every kid. So even just from the tachycardia cap refill alone, um, you know, I would just be like, oh, let's give some, this kid some fluids. Um, yeah, those are initial impressions. The headache is likely secondary to the dehydration or just feeling unwell. And then going over the physical exam, the uh, diffuse tenderness, uh, one thing with kids is that you got to be a really good investigator. Uh, I, I one time had a mom, and if I'm talking too much, just let me know and I can stop. No, you're um, great. This is fantastic. If I, I one time had a mom come in with the chief complaint of her, her kid uh, could not see eye, eye blackness. I'm like, oh, and this kid's just like chilling in the bed, right? And, uh, and I'm like, really? And I asked other things. And she also said, she's also nauseous. And I'm like, oh, she's nauseous, really? I asked the kid, are you nauseous? She's like, I'm nauseous. And I'm like, do you know what nauseous means? She's like, <laughs> and so, and, and then I, the, the mom was asking her, are you nauseous? And the kid's like, I am nauseous. And so like, uh, I, and one, another thing I do to test abdominal tenderness because kids just don't like to be touched when they're not feeling well. If I press like upper quadrant, they're like, ow. And I ask, did this hurt? Or the common, do you have owies? And they're like, I have owies. And then you press like right lower, ow. And then you, pr you press everywhere and they're going, ow. I'm like, hmm. And then I like, I like tickle the toe. I'm like, did that, was that owie? It's like, okay. And then like, I like squeeze, gently squeeze the fingers. Like, was that owie? I'm like, I'm like, all right, this, kid, this kid's going to say yes to everything, right? And so you really, really got to figure out, you got to get sneaky. So sometimes what I do is like, I, I do the, the oscillate. And so I'll like take my stethoscope and I pretend like I'm listening to their belly, but I'll just push really subtle, like, but I'll push in. And so if they, if they like pull against me or they like flinch or squinch or whatever, that, that communicates to me tenderness more so. Um, and an eight-year-old, normally they're pretty honest by then. An eight-year-old, they, they can typically communicate pretty well uh, what hurts, what doesn't. Uh, so these rules are more specific for like maybe six and under, but but some eight-year-olds, 
they're still kind of mommy's boy and they don't really know how to explain things. So, or if they're autistic, you know, if they're autistic, that's uh, always changes things too, or Down syndrome. So, so like one thing I, I wanted to kind of jump back to that you had mentioned, Justin. So you said that you would start fluids in this kid. And I, you know, I think we, the, that's what, that's what happened as well. What, what would you choose for fluid type and then how much, and we can talk more about, you know, how to figure that out a little bit more later, but you know, if you were just going to say, looking at this kid, um, we don't really have a weight on him, but if you would like, how do you, how do you think about, um, starting fluids and would you start continuous or give him a bolus? Uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, so, um, one, I'd yell at my nurses, get a weight <laughs> because, <laughs> Uh, the, the mills per weight dictates the whole projection of this kid's hospitalization, if it's going to lead to that. And so at least at Children's Mercy, kind of what we think. So one, I'll answer your question first. Um, there's two kind of golden, uh, bolus fluid, uh, starts that you think about in the ER. Um, it's the 20 per kilo and the 10 per kilo. And by per kilo, I mean milliliters per kilo. And so for really easy math, if, I, if this kid, eight years old, um, you know, let's say, let's say they're like 25 kilos, something like that, like seven, you know, 50 or 60 ish pounds. Let's go like, let's go, let's go 30, 30 kilos, a slightly fat kid. And so, um, or appropriately weight. Uh, he, uh, 30, 30 per kilo, 20 mils. And so that's like, what, six, 600? 600, 600 um, someone check my math, I'm pretty sure. So yeah, 600 milliliters um, given to the kid. And the bolus is, hold on, 20 times 30. Yeah, that's right. Okay, I was going crazy. <laughs> and so, um, and the boluses per our protocols typically ran over an hour. And so, like you know, this kid, he's 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 unwell, right? But he's he's completely stable. You know, I'm not worried about this kid crashing. I'm not worried about this kid being in hypovolemic shock. I'm not. And if this kid is like entering, I mean, he could be considered like septic. Um, if he looks really really crappy, as as like if he looks crappier than his blood pressure is showing, um, I still don't know if I just like slam fluids into him. So I think the hour is appropriate. Um, and so you kind of let that run. Fluid choices. We are a normal saline kind of hospital. Uh, I, there are physicians in our hospital that do lactated ringers. It's very, very rare. Even though, like, if this kid's ha has so much diarrhea that he's just pooping out bicarb, um, it's still pretty rare for us to use a sodium bicarb bolus of a, a patient. Uh, I, I don't know if that's evidence based or if that's just kind of like our hosp hospital culture. And so in this kid, it'd be very, very typical to do a normal saline 20 milliliters per kilo bolus. Uh, what, 20, 20 mils per kilo is kind of the go-to. Uh, the big times you think about 10 mils per kilo is if you're concerned that this patient might be a, a cardiac patient, like a heart patient, and they can't handle fluid overload well. Um, if they have a liver dysfunction, um, or if for some reason they're already uh, at risk of like uh, pulmonary edema, or um, you know the heart's just not pumping properly, uh, and you just want to go slow. Or if nephrology kind of like is involved, and they kind of um, know the kid really well, and maybe this kid has really poor uh, kidneys, and you just want to go slower in kidney, uh, fluid resuscitation. Uh, typically, it's the other way, but some some kids are kind of weird, and so those are kind of the the two big things. Uh, in the ER, it's pretty rare you're going to be doing maintenance IV fluids. By then, like they should be going up to the floor because you you ain't got that time for that kind of thing, and so. Um, all right. That was fantastic. Thank you, Justin. That, that, uh, is a really good breakdown. That, that's one thing I remember from my pediatrics rotation is that everything's math and everything's math. While, while, right. while, while I have a background in math based things, that's the reason there's a reason I didn't continue doing math based things. Yeah. Um, so in neurology, we have less math. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Sarah, what additional labs and or imaging would you like for this patient? Cause you're probably going to get some. We're probably gonna start some fluids, but now we're also thinking about what else we want to do. I guess, of course, because you have white blood count, so that's good. So maybe a CBC just to see if it would just in case there's this sepsis or this criteria. I don't know with the pediatric if there's a different criteria, but just to see if there's a leukocytosis or a neutropenia, um, and then also, I am yeah, like a CMP or maybe just a BMP for the kid. But I think this is, I don't remember if the BMP comes with 
the BUN and creatinine. So I it think does. it does. It does. So I guess you do that too. And then maybe if you wanted to, you could assess like, this is later though, like you could do urine analysis or like the urine sodium concentration, osmolarity and et cetera, serum versus urine if you wanted to. But I think that's more in the weeds, like for maybe an adult patient, you might consider that um, if, but for now, I guess we could just do the basic CBC um, and BMP or CMP. I don't know if I'm thinking of it. I'm missing anything else. No, I think I think you you nailed it. And I think I would agree with you on the UA. I I think you would want a UA. I guess we'll talk about what we get in a second here. But in, in addition, I think it's really easy, especially in like the adult world, to think about. You know, you're looking for a you know, uh, an infection. You're looking for something like that. But there's also there's a lot more information, like specific gravity, ketones, protein, et cetera, like that. Especially in pediatrics, those you know those kind of things show up and make a difference in, you know, what you're thinking in terms of dehydration. And if there, if you see ketones that can lead you towards lots of different thought process. So, all right, so we'll go ahead and uh, give some labs. So we got a CBC. Um, I do not have all of the results of the CBC, but that was found to be within normal limits. Um, so we got a BMP, I uh, got a sodium of 143 a potassium of 4.1, a chloride of zero, sorry, 109, uh, CO2 of 28, a BUN of 10, creatinine of 0.53, and a glucose, glucose of 83. So that was pretty, pretty within normal limits, uh, BMP. And then we also got a UA which showed a specific gravity of 1.035, which is abnormal, and then two plus ketones, which is also abnormal, one plus protein, um, no white blood cells, no red blood cells, no bacteria identified. Um, additionally, we also got some imaging. We got an abdominal ultrasound. Um, and the report showed that it was considered a category three, which um, basic, very basic terms just means that there's inflammation, but they don't see anything that's appendiceal as the cause. So they don't see like, oh yeah, that, that's a, a clear appendicitis. And that would be a different um, categorization. So you can, we have kind of this info. Sarah, what are you thinking about DISPO at this point? Because we, we know, you know, we kind of have talked about a little bit what we're thinking as the underlying cause. Um, our labs, you know, showed us there's some, some abnormalities. Do you think this kid is stable enough that we can give him fluids and send him home? Or would you think that we want to admit him? Um, given the ketones in his urine and he doesn't have hyperglycemia, I think that's like significant. I'm not, I mean, I think for a child, cause you usually only see that, you know, with DKA or severe dehydration. So yeah, I think he would need to be admitted and just watched because, you know, with fluids, you also have to, I guess this is, I think with fluids, you have to be careful about over bolusing or putting too much fluids and watching the kid. You don't want to cause any um, problems in the CNS. Um, so I guess I would consider admitting him given though he has a normal white blood count. I think more admit him just maybe for like 24 hours and see how he responds and everything. I don't know about the abdominal inflammation. Um, that sounds kind of concerning, but it's also an ultrasound. So it could just, yeah, yeah I don't know. <laughs> no, I think that that's a, I think that's a, a great, great thoughts. Um, Justin, can you comment on that? abdominal ultrasound finding and what what uh what are those what are those categories about uh yeah and i and i and i i have i have so much to say um <laughs> about about kind of the, the stuff we got in general yeah absolutely uh, so one to preface i always forget these categories um i'd have to kind of look them up to give really good specifics what i do know is that um so one now I now I almost wonder if it differs per hospital because if I remember correctly at our facility um, when you do abdominal ultrasounds uh, category one is like everything's fine you know no, no real concern and then like a category two is that um, the like appendix cannot be identified 
you know, like is not actively inflamed or whatever, but also like couldn't really be found. So not, probably not a concern. Uh, category three is like a little bit of inflammation, but may or may not be related. And then category four is like uh, that poor appendix, help it out, you know. Um, that's off the top of my head. Someone check that if that's incorrect, um, just because that, I kind of like, go ahead. What, what you said, Justin, is kind of what I remember, at least from my pediatrics rotation. It was like, one is you completely see it, it's okay. Two, it's only partially seen. Three is you don't can't find it. Four is it maybe five and then, and then like five is like there's an appendicitis or there is not an appendicitis. Or sorry, there's an appendicitis. There is appendiceal inflammation. And then there's like a, a separate one that's like it's a perforated. Um I that's what I remember, but also at the same time I'm not sure. Um I think that that might be like a radiology group kind of categorization as well. So I don't, I yeah. really don't know. And in our, in our radiology reads, they always kind of always have to detail what the reads even mean because you know most of us don't remember. What so one thing to just remember about these reads and and really any bit of information you get, and and this is really kind of hard as a medical student, and it, it, it took a lot of experience and kind of just going through different scenarios to kind of really put together what what does objective information mean and then what is it how does it relate to my patient and then how does it dictate what I'm going to do and so a category read is a radiologist interpretation of the imaging that they're seeing um, without the context of having seen the patient and anything else really like they're going purely off the chart right and so um you have to take that information then you really have to apply it to your patient and kind of like what are their primary concerns and what's going on and so this patient especially for a lot of newer newer providers um like med students interns maybe some nurse practitioners stuff like that uh, there can be a lot of temptation to chase things and so i think it's really important to like try to figure out why is the patient here and what is their biggest issue Right. And so like, is their biggest issue the abdominal pain? Because that's a very different workup. Is their biggest issue the diarrhea and the dehydration? Because that's also very different in how we're going to work this up. And I would say that this patient's biggest issue right now, again, like not having get to see how they see this patient in real life, um, is kind of the dehydration, which to me, my go to thing right now is that this is still probably a viral gastroenteritis. Uh, that's just be being poorly symptomatically managed um because like append appendicitis like diarrhea isn't like a classic thing that's that's not um like wh why is that going on like if it was abdominal pain and just nausea and vomiting like if you have a patient with just vomiting without diarrhea you have a completely different workup and that's uh, that's more more concerning right you're thinking twisted bowel you're thinking volvulus you're thinking appendicitis you're thinking obstruction etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, but with diarrhea it's like it's like, whew, okay, it can't be, it can't be near as bad. Um, and when you, and I keep saying viral because bacterial gastroenteritis is so, or enteritis largely, is so rare in the pediatrics um, field unless they already have something to set them up for that. You know, like uh, if they traveled or they have a immunodeficiency or they went swimming in like lake water and got you, you know, who knows. Um, so, there's a few things I wanted to comment on. One, um, if this patient truly got imaging not even 12 hours ago and they're a return, they're a return patient, it really kind of surprises me that they would get um, – I guess I wouldn't expect things to evolve that quickly when they look pretty stable. You know, um, like what what is that ultrasound going to tell you in 12 hours that's changed with a stable blood pressure and just a, some dehydration? And like your abdominal exam wasn't even that impressive, right? Um, and so it's like that that the CT would not have revealed uh, if those if it was an abdomen pelvis CT. And so uh, that's that's kind of just interesting that that occurred. Um, for the labs, I, I will say that like this is so provider dependent. But my general rule is that, or th a trend I've noticed is that a lot of a lot of adult physicians love their CBC. Um, and they get it in everything. Okay. Uh, I one time had an adult neurologist who was admitting an, a seizuring patient, like a, a classic epileptic patient. He's like, yeah, let's get a baseline CBC and CNP. I'm like, what does that even mean? Right. That's, that's not a thing in Pete's. We don't get baseline CBCs. Um, the CBC really has to kind of dictate a next step. And so in this patient, are you truly concerned for anemia? 
are you truly, and then is that white count going to change what you're going to do next? And so it's very, very, very unlikely that this is a bacterial gastroenteritis. And if you're thinking that this is truly an appendicitis and you're wanting to do empiric antibiotics, um, maybe that CBC will help you. But then you'd normally want to pair it with a CRP because a CRP, we kind of use as adults use lactates. We, we use CRPs to kind of trend um, infectious response to treatments, uh, like a, a, a acute inflammation. Um, and so, but if this patient's already had a normal CT, that'd be pretty surprising. Um, but, you know, I've been fooled before. Uh, the BMP is probably the go-to lab if you're going to get labs. And the fact that this BMP was actually so normal almost surprised me. Um, I almost would have expected a little bit of hypernatremia. The bicarb really shocked me. I would have I would have expected this kid to be acidotic, especially because he's got two plus ketones. And so um, that's that's almost surprising, especially because it's so high. Um, Creatinine's beautiful. BON is also surprisingly normal as well. I'd expect it to be slightly bumped, if anything. But you know. It's fine. Maybe you just caught him at a good moment. Maybe you got these labs after you gave a bolus, which shame on you. You should have gotten them before. Um, and then the urine, again, you're dry, right? Like, and the ketones, it's probably because the kid's not eating. Mm -hmm. the, this kid's just, yeah, this kid's basically doing a keto diet, right? He's get, trying to get shredded. And so um, I've had so many med students or, uh, or interns even, they're just like, oh my gosh, this patient's got a ketonuria. Um, but exactly what you said, Sarah, but like, their, but their sugars are normal. This is, should we do a diabetic workup? Like what's going on? I'm like, yo, the kid hasn't eaten a sandwich in like two days. Like, it's like, I would expect him to be ketonuric. Um, and so, yeah, one thing I would have done, if you're going to get the BMP and if they looked really sick, you get it early, right? So that you can get a comparison. Um, and same with the urine. The urine's like fine. Like again, like these, like some providers would have gotten them, some would not have. I probably would have leaned on not. What I would have done is do the 20 per kilo bolus and see clinically how he changes. Did his heart rate come down? Does he look better? Does he look more peppered up? Give us some ibuprofen. Does his fever go down? Does his exam go from squealing and curled up to playing on the on the phone, like a positive phone sign? You know, like um, those are all great responses. And it finds out the kid just needed to catch up on fluid losses. And so um, your clinical exam in kids is so valuable and you can you can do so much from it. So I, I would have probably reassessed before doing a deeper workup, especially after, I mean, I would not have gotten imaging on this kid this early, um, especially without having reassessed how he responded to the first bolus. And a general rule is you have 60 mils per kilo of reassessment to work with. So we kind of think of that as three 20, 20 excuse me, three 20 mil per kilo boluses. Um, now, if after 40, if you gave them two 40 or two 20 per kilo boluses, and they still look pretty bad, by then you should probably be communicating either with the floor or the ICU, because for some reason, this kid is not responding to fluid resuscitation and, um, and the workup has not been very elucidating. Uh, this probably won't be likely for this kid because the blood pressure is normal, white count's normal, uh, it's not even acidotic, even with uh, ketones. And um, yeah, his, his abdominal exam wasn't super remarkable. So those are things to just kind of comment on. Um, labs should dictate what you do, especially in our pa patient population that's all like Medicaid, like kids are all like Medicaid. And so just throwing labs at them willy-nilly is kind of, uh, you know, it's not, it's not good stewardship of, of, of us as physicians. So, so um, we did end up, just kind of going through additional um, management steps on here. So we did end up admitting him um, pretty early in the in the night at about 10, 10 o'clock. I mean, we started on um, maintenance IV fluids of 0.9% normal saline. Um, we also started him on ibuprofen, 600 milligrams Q6 for pain and fever. Um, so Sarah, after, you know, we, we've admitted him, you know, we the kind of had Justin talked about, you know, the reason for wanting to admit, we did admit for this patient, when you're going to go back and reassess, what are some things that you're going to be looking for? And you want to be asking your nurses about, um, and, you know, just the general things that you with with this kind of dehydration management that you'd be kind of wanting to watch out for? Um. Uh, I guess just to make sure that he's responding to the fluid. So just do a re-exam on the capillary refill. 
um, to make sure that it's improved to two seconds or less. And then also see if there's, you could do skin tinting, I guess, on the abdomen, but it's like if the kid's not very um, amenable to the examination that you don't necessarily need to do that. And then maybe see the mucous membranes are dry and just watch the kid and see if a kid's sleeping, if they're being more interactive, less interactive. And then I guess vital signs, of course, monitoring that. I don't know how it is depending on what, if you're in the ED, if it's maybe like every four hours or I don't know if they're going to be doing it like Q1 hour because it's more ICU, you know, bed status. So depending on how much the nurses can really do during that time, if it's really busy, like you said, in the emergency department, they may not be able to do all of that. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I know, absolutely. I think that kind of like Justin was saying, you know, that, that clinical exam, when you look back in the room, is he now not sitting in pain and is looking better or is he continues to look kind of crappy and we're just kind of like, what's going on? Um, one additional thing that we did that we did get and we're always going to be monitoring in our in our PEDS patients is urine output. And that's a um, amount per weight per hour um, because it, it will de- it will vary by um, weight, how much they should be putting out. Um, and, you know, like infants, we can always think about how many wet diapers or things like that. But in, uh, you know, you can start actually monitoring it as they as they get a little bit older. So eight hours after you admitted this patient, um, their urinary output is 0.2 cc's per kilogram per hour. They're still in severe pain. They didn't sleep. And their cap refill is four seconds. So and you haven't had your, ha- haven't had your pediatric rotation yet, Sarah, but what do you think about that urinary output of 0.2 cc's per kilogram per hour? And if you can just, if you say, I don't know, it's fine, but if you think that's Low, oh yeah, normal. that's really bad. I was in the ICU for SICU trauma for my surgery. And I know for adults, it was like, if you get them at 0.5 and I know kids, you definitely want them to be more hydrated than adults. So that's definitely really bad because it's below the 0.5 mark for adults. So it's definitely severe dehydration. Then being a child, I think that they have even higher urine output um, levels that you want versus like a 50 year old adult. So yeah, it looks pretty bad. Yeah. And the cap refill of course is more significant it seems mm-hmm. like justin what what would you consider to be a normal urinary output just like range wise basically above uh one milliliter per kilogram per hour so yeah uh, yeah this is pretty severely dehydrated mm-hmm. for sure so i'll, I'll kind of start with you justin on this one so when you see this response after you've started your resuscitation what are you thinking? Are you, are you going to change your management strategy or would you continue the course or what do you, what do you, what do you th- what would you be thinking about at this point in time? Uh, again, this is like hard to contextualize without uh, an actual weight, but, um, but one, that ibuprofen 600 milligrams Q6, if you have that scheduled, you're going to destroy that kid's kidneys. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I would say most adult weights are, are, are doing 600, uh, so for an eight-year-old to do 600, that's that's pretty impressive. Um, but that's that's kind of an aside thing. I, I can't escape, but for helidosing, it's a sickness. Uh, for the fluids, so assuming that this kid's not eating that much, um, you know, he's kind of nauseous, and obviously he's not drinking anything, um, I probably would have added a little bit of sugar to his fluids. This may be like a cultural thing at my hospital. Uh, we tend to be more frivolous with it. So like uh, dextrose 5, normal saline, less like 0.9%. Um, and then we do it like for this kid, uh, I, I would assume that in the ER, I would have hoped that they would have done at least one more bolus. Um, but if they didn't, you know, and this kid's pretty severely dehydrated, we could probably run him at like one and a half maintenance if he's not responding to maintenance IV fluids. And so maintenance IV fluids would be, um, so the, the calculation you can do, the one that we always do is the four, two, one rule where, um, for the first 10 kilos, of their weight, you do four milliliters per kilo. And so like an easy way to remember their first 10 kilos is 40 mils per hour. And then um, the next 10 kilos after that is two. And so if they weighed like um, 60, or I'm sorry, if they weighed 20 kilos, they get 40 for the first 10, 20 for the next 10 for 60. So easy benchmarks to remember is um, that 20 is gonna be 60 mils per hour. And then um, at, if they're 60 kilos, they get 100 mils per hour because then every kilo after 
the 20 is, is one mil per hour. And so, um, but you can, that, that'd be one times maintenance. That's like basic what they should get in a day. Uh, for this kit, I'd probably be doing one and a half maintenance. Um, so you just take that 150% and kind of see how they respond to that. You know, I, I, I'm a little surprised with that BMP uh, and that heart rate that has taken them this long. I still think right now, you know, we've ruled out a lot of the nasty nasties that could kill the kid. Um, the kid's obviously not perforating. The kid's obviously not having bowel twisting. The kid, as of now, does not have appendicitis, at least seen on imaging, um, and does not have an impressive white count, which is reassuring. And then, um, but it sounds like the kid's just dumping and not, not replenishing. So he's pooping everything out, uh, but he's not, he doesn't want to eat and drink. And, and mom has bought into him and she's like, please make him feel better. And she's like, not encouraging him well enough. Sometimes parents can be your greatest allies or greatest enemies. And so, um, yeah, I would do one and a half maintenance. And then uh, if he's still not responding to that, or even before starting that, I'd maybe give him a good bolus and then start him on that and just really, really flood him and see what happens. Uh, this is a kid I would probably um, keep on Q4 hour vitals, maybe do Q2 hours for like through the night just to, just to keep good tabs on him, make sure we're not missing anything if he starts to crash, uh, which with a normal blood pressure, I'm not super concerned about, but he's kind of on the verge. And then... Um, this is maybe a kid that I would go check on at least two to three times in the night to keep getting a comparison exam to see how he's responding. And so those would be major things. Um, the ibuprofen, I would not, again, other than the dosing thing, uh, probably decrease that dose a little bit. I don't think I'd schedule it. Um, if their pain is really that bad, I think that kind of dictates a different workup. Um, and I'd want to know like where their pain is that bad, but that's kind of a whole different shebang. Yeah, absolutely. That was a great discussion, both of you guys. I think that um, kind of really speaks to kind of what we were doing and thinking with this patient. And I think kind of going back to your to your point about maintenance fluids, um, that 421 rule, you'll definitely see that in all your pediatrics rotations, Sarah. So you'll get to hear that one more as well. Um, but when, when to use main, or uh, like one and a half maintenance and some things is it's, it's when you're having really bad dehydration or you're having additional losses during that time. So like our, like our patient, you know, he was dehydrated obviously, but he was also still having diarrhea during that time. So he was not just, I am dehydrated. We are replenishing. He is, I'm dehydrated and I'm continuing to get worse. And so that bumping that up to the 1.5 does make sense. And so, you know, if we're thinking, Things like he's vomiting a whole bunch, having diarrhea, and even things like uh, fever or burns or other things that can also, I mean, burns are its own separate uh, dehydration picture, obviously, um, but yeah. So, and, and another thing, I, I'd maybe just add like an antiemetic, like Undansetron, um, just so that, you know, IV fluids are great, but you also want to get this kid ready to eventually go home. And so you also want to like push oral fluids as well, PO fluids. And so just trying to make them, help them up for success with that and uh, maybe help like any nausea that's worsening that. Absolutely. Okay, so kind of to wrap it up. Um, so the next day, they, he ended up getting a complete abdominal ultrasound, which he hadn't actually had a complete abdominal ultrasound with the increasing pain. We just wanted to make sure that, like uh, Justin had kind of mentioned, you know, make sure we're not missing like a volvulus or anything, you know, we're not missing anything else. Um, and that showed no, no evidence of any kidney or biliary stone, no intussusception, but it did a dish again show enlarged mesenteric lymph nodes consistent with mesenteric lymphadenitis. Um, we got a, a repeat BNP um, and that did show some abnormalities this time. So he had a sodium of 145, which was abnormal, potassium of 4.1, Chloride of 116, uh, bicarb of 20, a BUN of 10, a creatinine of 0.7, and a glucose of 83. And this was before we had switched to um, had switched to any uh, maintenance fluid. So he was still at the just like general. Uh, his one-time uh, maintenance fluid dosing. 
Um, so with that kind of Justin quickly, what do you think of, what do you think of that, about that BMP and what do you think we would change? Uh, again, just like, uh, surprised that the BON is just riding steady. <laughs> it's like, um, but, uh, you know, you could probably switch to something without chloride. He's getting, um, I probably would have, I'm also kind of surprised that's the CO2, but he's, 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 he's encroaching on a hyperchloremic acidosis. Like he's getting, he's not acidotic yet, but he's, he's on his way towards this. And so uh, his chloride's pretty high. So you could, you could switch to like lactated ringers. Um, you could temporarily switch to like sodium bicarb. Um, both are appropriate. Uh, you know, at this point, this kid's kind of like off of the easy protocols. And so you kind of just have to keep close eyes on him and uh, adjust your fluids as appropriate. Um, but yeah, I'd probably switch to, uh, LR. Yeah. Um, and then just get another BMP probably in six or 12 hours, mm -hmm. depending yeah. on how he looked. So at this point, um, we switched his IV fluid regimen to one and a half times maintenance and then switched to lactated ringers, um, because it, he was developing that like hyperchlorinic non anion gap acidosis. So if you actually calculated that gap, he would, it'd be, it's non anion gap, um, and so, you know, you just want to make sure that you are not overdoing it with the normal saline, which is kind of what the, the picture looked like for him. Um, and he did have a little bit of that bumping creatinine, which I think we were kind of expecting earlier. Uh, like, I, like you had mentioned, the BUN was normal. So it's kind of like it's you might, you know, if you get, continue to get them, you might see some of that pre-renal kind of picture going on. Um, but so and then for pain control, he was still in quite a bit of pain this time. So. We switched up his um, pain control to Toradol, uh, 15 milligrams Q6. Um, that was scheduled. Uh, Tylenol, 650 Q6 as needed. And then morphine, 3 milligrams Q4 as needed. Um, I, I, I personally didn't take care of this patient. I don't know, Justin, if you, you know, I see your face. I think additionally those NSAIDs, I don't know um, what your um, thoughts are on that, but... I, adenitis must really suck, and I just haven't had enough patients with adenitis. Um, or, or man, they just let the residents do whatever they wanted on this one. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the creatinine could be twofold. Like, the creatinine could be that you are slamming this kid with high dose NSAIDs and he's super dehydrated, um, or, or it's just a natural progression and it's eventually going to turn around. Um, like, you know, ketorolac, toradol, or ketorolac, toradol is, is an NSAID as well. So you just got to be careful with scheduling it on top of have, having just been on scheduled high dose ibuprofen. Uh, again, another reason to uh, keep close tabs with BMP and checking the, up on the patient. Um, that, I think it's surprising that the Tylenol wasn't already on, at least as a PRN. So I think that's totally appropriate. Uh, the morphine is, you know, if he's having that much diarrhea, I, I'm not opposed to a couple of doses of opiates. Yeah, bit. slow them down a little bit too. Like you know, it might double double smack them. Um, but yeah, wow, that pain. Um, again, I haven't had many adenitis patients, so, so maybe maybe yeah. it really is that bad. And so wow, I've, that's I've impressive. seen. Yeah, I saw uh, an adult patient. So you know, the pediatric thing, adult or children are not tiny or are not tiny adults, but. They, I had a guy who had mesenteric lymphadenitis secondary to like cat scratch disease, actually, which is that was an interesting thing. But uh, he was in a lot of pain, it was like, it was like we were like, Are you sure this is not like an acute abdomen weird thing going on? Um, but uh, he was not comfortable and he could tell us he was not comfortable, so that made it you know, that's my that's my visual thing that I think about. Um, but so for our patient, I'm um, just kind of wrap up. So we can kind of continue that course. We're able to kind of wean off of, uh, we're able to wean off of the uh, uh, pain control, continue those maintenance fluids. He continued to slowly improve and he was able to uh, be discharged after about five days of kind of getting over the diarrhea, the vomiting and uh, the, the pain as well. Um, and so he was able to be discharged without anything uh, else needed. Um, so any, do you, either you, Justin or Sarah have any final comments and ab about things that you learned, or at least one to two big takeaways that you got from this case? Um, this is a not, this is a bad joke, but I know the popsicle test is the best when you do kids. 
Oh, I love it. When I was in the ED, it would be like a popsicle or ice cream. And the kids, if they were eating it and tolerating the PO, it was like almost time to discharge home. <laughs> so that was the only thing. But yeah, I learned a lot. This is great. Um, I feel, feel like I'm going to be doing well on my pediatric rotation for dehydration. Thank you, Justin. And thank you, John. And thank you all of you for this, because this was really good experience for me. Absolutely. Um, thank I, you very much, Sarah. You did a fantastic job, especially considering that you, you hadn't had your pediatric rotation yet. So. Thank you. Yeah, honestly, That's Sarah, I'll let you go ahead. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I think I learned about adenitis and how it can... Um, like five days of pain and dehydration, holy moly, you know, <laughs> that must have really sucked. And so, uh, you know, I think this was also just a good reminder that kids don't follow a lot of typical roadmaps, right? Like uh, some would have expected that sodium or the creatinine or the BUN or the bicarb on that BMP to be very different, right? Um, maybe on this kid, he would have had a larger inflammatory response. What if his Y count was high, you know, whatever. Um, and so, his blood pressure was totally fine. And yet his urine output was uh, two mils per kilo per hour after a bolus. Right. And so kids can sometimes be very unpredictable. Um, I've had a kid who came in, he was vomiting in the triage room. And then by the time he rolled to his ER, he was coding and he had cardiac arrest. And so uh, because he had a twisted bowel that perforated and he just instantly changed. And so uh, kids are unpredictable and kids uh, compensate really well until they don't. Um, so yeah, this is just a good to rem a reminder that not every kid's the same and your clinical exam is everything. Um, kids are harder to treat by the numbers. And so you kind of have to just keep getting your impression on these kids. Um, so this, yeah, this is great. Thanks, John. And um, I thought you were a really good um, curator of all this. And Sarah, like, honestly, you, I thought you did amazing. You're basically like answering questions at like a M4 early intern level. So even without the experience, so. Thank you. Excellent. Well, I appreciate you guys taking the time to uh, go through this case. I think it's one of those, you know, dehydration. It's, it's like a very, it's one of the most common things I think you see during your pediatrics rotation, but I think everyone freaks out when they see everything is a weighted dosing of something, me included. That's part of the reason I didn't go into pediatrics personally outside of, I don't really like kids, but, um, <laughs> but no, we really, yeah, I know. Sorry, Justin. Um, but we, I really appreciate uh, you guys taking the time to uh, walk through that case. And also thank you to Brianna who did actually create this case. I am just the presenter on this one. So she did a fantastic job getting it all uh, put together for us. Thanks everyone. This was a blast.